Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, House Republicans are here to offer a budget which is crafted through the eyes of the hardworking residents of the state of Connecticut. So in times when government continues to benefit from inflation, as we've seen with the uh, continued escalation of sales tax collections, residents are finding that their paychecks are not going as far as they used to. And so with that in mind, we are proposing uh, a historic $1.16 billion of broad-based tax relief in the state of Connecticut. We are standing with the governor on reducing the income tax by half a percent and also restoring the pastor entity tax credit. We are creating new and historic tax credits in our code and we are continuing to offer re relief to our seniors by recognizing the rising costs and we are proposing the phase out of the cliff uh, on our retirement income taxes. And so with that, I'm introducing our ranking member of the Finance Committee to outline in more detail our tax proposal. Thank you, Representative Candelora. And I'm thrilled to be here today to explain in more detail this historic package of tax relief for our residents and our businesses. As Representative Candelora mentioned, we are mirroring the governor in that reduction of half a percent and getting rid of that 3% to 2%. We are going to, for the first time, put in place a child tax exemption. For every child you have, you will have a $2,000 deduction on your income tax. Connecticut is one of the few states in the country that doesn't recognize family size in its tax code. So today we take the first step toward doing that. We know how our seniors have suffered. We've heard about the cliff for exemptions on Social Security and pensions. So we propose softening that cliff and allowing our hardworking seniors to retain more of their retirement income so they can stay in the state, the state where they grew up and worked and loved where their families live. We want them here today. We maintain the earned income tax credit at current levels because we know how important that is to support families. We work to help businesses succeed by extending and restoring the full level of that pass-through entity tax. Businesses are the engine of our economy and the small and, small and medium-sized businesses owned by individuals really need all our help to succeed. They employ our residents. They invest in our capital goods. They send the money to this building so we can provide the needed goods and services. And with that, I will hand it back to Representative Candelora, who will explain just how we are going to be spending some of that money on those needed goods and services. Yeah, thank you, Holly. And, and also, as we, we know, um, inflation has hit our homes. And one of the additional items that we do is reinstate the clothing tax exemption um, from children's clothing on sales tax up to a, $100 per item. Um, that was something that was taken away when we were in difficult economic times. We need to begin to restore uh, those exemptions, which are truly regressive uh, for families. And so that is also an additional policy. You know, yesterday we saw consensus revenue numbers come out, and it demonstrated exactly why we instituted the volatility cap in 2017. When I was ranking member on the Finance Committee in, in 2008, uh, I served in that committee and, and continued on in the budget process, and each year watching every quarter of consensus revenue result in massive deficits, and we would have to continue to rework the budget. From a Republican perspective, I think there was one year that we put out five different budget proposals in one given year, because every time there was a, a downtick in the income tax revenue, that volatile income, we saw us slip right into a deficit. And so although yesterday we saw a decline of $500 million of our tax revenue, it has no impact on our budget because the cap is actually working to remove the volatility from the budgeting process. And so when we crafted this budget, unlike our Democrat counterparts, we left not only 
the actual caps intact, but we are honoring the spirit of those caps to get us back to fiscal health and begin returning uh, the money back to the people, whether it be through income tax reductions, but also through additional programming support. And so with that, this budget reflects uh, a historic increase of education funding. It's also for the first time going to fully fund our special education cost share. Uh, it's increasing our funding to nonprofit organizations, our private providers who have called for uh, increases due to minimum wage increases and inflation. And then finally, like the Democrats, we, we do fund our higher education. However, along with higher education and transportation, we've continued to see that those two uh, entities continue um, to spend at a pace that just does not keep up with our current levels. And so for the transportation uh, increase, we are attaching uh, the reinstating of a uh, transit authority that's going to look at uh, how our spending is done at that, uh, in our transportation and find $100 million of savings over the next couple of years because we can't continue to sustain 100% subsidization of our public transportation system. You know, additionally, higher ed, we have the same uh, policy there. We're seeing the higher ed system beginning to cannibalize each other, um, and we have successful institutions subsidizing ones that aren't so successful. We need to look at that policy and ask them to come out with a report that provides savings. And so we are funding them, but we are uh, attaching fiscal reform with that funding. And with that, I'd like to introduce our um, ranking member of appropriations, Tammy Nuccio, who could go through in greater detail some of our proposals. Thank you, Vin, uh, and good morning. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying this has been a long process, and we have done this a little different than the way the House, the, the legislature up here has done that. And Holly and I have worked in concert to put forward a ways and means budget that takes into consideration the revenue and the spending so that we ensure we are under the caps, both revenue cap and spending cap, and we are definitely staying within the nature um, and the intent of the guardrails, which is very important because for Connecticut, for Connecticut to continue to be successful and to grow even more, we have put these things in place to help us and to guide us to do that. So in doing so, um, the spending side of our package definitely reflects the priorities that we have as a caucus. First and foremost, our number one bullet on this is education. It is the state of Connecticut's constitutional obligation to provide a free and public education for every child in the state. And we have woefully underfunded education um, in the past years here. So what we're doing is $290 million over the gov governor's proposal and uh, about $140 million over the appropriations proposal, where we are looking at higher funding of ECS. We're looking at um, most, very importantly, we've seen a huge uptick in the amount of children who are diagnosed um, as special needs, or, and that's causing a, ma a massive increase in our taxes at our local levels. So this is going to help property tax from the perspective of us funding more of the education on the state of Connecticut's uh, side of the ledger. And in doing so, we are going to, for the first time, fully fund the excess cost grant at 100%, which has not been done before, um, and the towns are pleading for it. Um, we're also focusing in on domestic violence efforts and expanding not only GPS for, for domestic violence um, victims, but we're also looking at fully funding our VOCA costs to help for our um, for the domestic violence on that also. We are looking at uh, increasing aid to the homeless population at about $10 million over the two years. We're also looking at the increasing the amount of support we're given to nonprofits to a 2.5% increase for both years. Um, that's a big thing that we've been hearing about, and we have to make sure that we're fully funding or funding as much as we can for the nonprofits. We're also looking at an upcoming issue that's been happening in various parts of the state regarding um, well contamination, and we're putting in money for PFAS also. So we're covering the environment, we're covering homeless, we're covering the nonprofits, education, um, public safety. We're doing a lot here. And as Representative Candelara said, the key with our higher ed spending and our transportation is we have got to make sure 
we are addressing the root cause. We can continue to fund these things at high subsidies, but if we do not correct the root cause of why it is so expensive to go to college in the state of Connecticut, as much subsidization that we can do is not going to help the root cause. It's not going to help student loans. It's not going to help our youth that are young adults that are coming out of college with massive debt. We have to attack the root issue. So by putting these plans in place, we're asking them to be part of the solution and help us find a sustainable and implementable plan that is going to bring down the cost of education. Because we really need to focus in funding in on our younger children and making sure they have the best education possible. And this this budget that's before you today will do that. Education is our priority. Tax relief is our priority. Our seniors are our priority. And this budget reflects that across the path in a ways and means way between tax relief and spending. Thank you. Yeah, as stated before, the last time we, we put forth the budget was in 2017. Uh, and that led to bipartisan negotiations that have led to historic uh, surpluses um, responsible spending uh, and the, con the recognition that we need to focus on our unfunded liabilities. And so five years later, we are here today to renew that call because we all know that when Republicans are in the room and part of the conversation, good things happen. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, what is, what is the two-year spending? What is your total? How much money do you spend in FY24? How much money do you spend in FY25? How much are you under the spending cap? Um, what's the bottom line on your revenue package? Sure, I'll just start out by saying that overall we are 1% higher than the governor in spending. Uh, in the first year we're below the governor, the second year we're a little bit higher because of our education funding. I'm gonna turn it over to Tammy to give you the details. So from a spending cap perspective, we're about 5.8 million underneath the cap uh, in year one, and we're about 192 million under in year two. Our total spending is just about $50.1 billion, um, and we're under also in the revenue surplus for both years. We are under all of the caps, fully balanced. Revenue. What's the bottom line for FY24, FY25? Spending? Yes. Bottom line of spending for 24 is 25 billion, and 25 is 25.7 billion. Thank you. You're very welcome. Can you talk about the broad-based tax cuts? We've seen two plans, right, from the governor and the appropriations committee. The governor, some would say, is a little more generous and allow people with higher income. Can you break it down on what this really means in comparison to that, and what your plan would give? middle and lower income sure well we mirror the governor in terms of the actual changes to the the tax brackets the five to four and a half and the three to two on the other hand we do institute the recapture so the top one percent of taxpayers are not going to see the benefit we're concentrating this on middle class families middle-class family, how high is the income level for this tax break? I believe it's 300, 300,000 for single and 400,000 for couples, but I'll, I'll we'll, we'll get you that exact yeah, number. Yeah, no. it's, it's affecting the 5% the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So if you were in the 5% tax bracket or lower, you were going to see a tax mm -hmm. decrease. And we also do make that retroactive to January 1st so that people get a full year of the tax rebate, um, and that is where we yeah. differ. Yeah, I the believe government. the governor's budget start doesn't start this until uh, 2024. So I added up, and, and please let me know if my math is wrong. Um, I think your total income tax reduction, just the rate stuff and the, and the retroactive is about 800 million? It, 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 the income tax is about that, yes. Okay. And without being too simplistic, what do you see are the major differences between what you're proposing and what we've already seen? From a revenue perspective? Um, from a tax relief perspective. Yeah, I mean, from a, from a tax relief perspective, as we said, we are putting forth a proposal that gives an entire year of tax relief. You know, so for, for the next tax filing, you are going to see a more substantial tax decrease. Um, the Democrats and the governor start that tax relief six months later than us. Um, the other piece, I think, from tax relief standpoint, as Holly mentioned, uh, we want to begin to institute 
the deductions for children. You know, our tax code should be mirror mirror mirroring more of the federal government, um, and we're trying to get away from this rebate system. So people that are actually paying the taxes are the ones that are getting the relief. And you mentioned this or answered their question or someone's question about 1% more in spending than both budgets. And what does that mean in terms of dollars? So it's, it's not both. It's just the governors. 1% more in spending. What does that mean? So overall, it's, it's about 200, um, 200 million, which is reflected in our funding of the education uh, the ECS, the cost that sharing. Total, total for both for this era. It's in year two where we have the increased spending. Okay. Uh, then can I ask you why the Senate Republicans aren't here? I had, a, I had thought that they were going to join. Well, I, I think, um, you know, House Republicans right now felt it was necessary to come forward with a budget. I mean, as we said before, we want to be part of the budget conversation. And after seeing what came out of the Finance Committee in particular, we recognize the fact that we, we need a reset in this building uh, and we want to see better, more thoughtful tax relief. Um, frankly, we uh, want to see more of what the governor has done. Um, I think, you know, the, the Senate Republicans have certainly share in a lot of these concepts uh, as well, um, but I, I think they're, they're going in a different direction. Speaking of the governor, have you had a chance to discuss with him some of your proposals, and where do you think some of your proposals will end up? Yeah, you could do the tax ID. Yes. Sure. We've had, met, we've yeah. had many conversations. We ha we, yes, I mean, there are ongoing conversations with the governor's office, and I think, you know, there we have similarities here, and I think the one area in which we have the most similarity and most differ from certainly the revenue package that came out of the Finance Committee is in the necessity necessity to respect and maintain the fiscal guardrails. As you know, finance passed out a package that created revenue intercepts starting this year to take money away, to sweep it before it gets into the general fund, and set up off-budget accounts. That's exactly the kind of bad behavior that got us in trouble in the past. We are only able to have this conversation today because of that bipartisan budget in 2017 and those good fiscal guardrails that are put in place. So I am by the, the fiscal guardrails, but without getting, and I haven't had a chance to look at the numbers. So if you're spending more and you're giving more money to higher ed, where are you taking money away from? Well, that's here, and there's been incredible lot of work done to make sure the money is spent in the right way. And I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank friend. you. So yes, both sides. We've all had conversations with the governor. We've um, definitely told him what's in our plan and what our priorities are, especially around education and that. He's been very receptive, um, and he has asked point blank if if we are employing any gimmicks. And I said no. I'm an accountant. I believe in both sides of the balance sheet being equal. So, no, um, we've definitely had good conversations. In regards to the spending, the governor specifically did not spend in the year two, knowing that there were large initiatives that were coming, especially around education. So it's Im pretty impossible to stick within his if we are going to do this broad-based education um, reform, which we're looking to do. The other thing that we did is um, there are some things that happen within governmental budgeting that don't exist outside of government, <laughs> specifically around, you know, assuming that you are going to be fully staffed as of July 1st, 2023, right? The state of Connecticut has not been super successful in filling a lot of these open positions and on average is running between a 14 to 20 percent vacancy rate. So to assume that you are going to magically fill every position on July 1st is um, something that belongs in, in Hogwarts and not in the real world. So some of the money that will take for some of the things that you would like come from the fact we're not going to fill those positions? Is that what you're Not that we're not going to fill them, but that we're going to fill them in a realistic expectation. Um, so we specifically, I specifically reached out to every department, and we did this on the um, Appropriations Committee, and asked for their uh, staffing, filled staffing, funded staffing, vacancies, uh, what they've had over the last few years, what their hiring patterns are. And then we used that. Um, I use that to build out an entire expectation of staffing uh, and to see where we could find savings. If you look at our lapses, we lapse over a hundred plus million dollars a year just in um, personnel services, right? That's money that we're taking from the taxpayers that is then 
going to the cap, it's going to like the pay down the debt and everything else, which I'm a huge proponent of. But when we're looking at making broad-based reform here, whether it be on the revenue side or on our spending side, you have to have realistic budgets. You have to have a real-world view of how opens are filled. And in doing so, we were able to really generate um, a more accurate picture of what the staffing of the state of Connecticut is. It is, full, it is amping up to have us fully staffed by the end of um, by the end of the year, which I don't know whether or not that's realistic from a hiring pattern perspective, but um, it does build in a vacancy rate, which every business in the world besides government does. So we're bringing government into you know real world expectation. Hey, ben, you want to give us your political analysis as the impact of this on an attempt to shape the budget package or to indicate to the governor yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. You know, what, you, what you've heard out of Representative Nuccio is we really worked on the spending side of the budget um, to make sure that we are right-sizing government and putting the focus on programs. And so in the Appropriations Committee, you saw many Republicans actually vote for the Democrat spending plan um, because the governor did leave room for that to happen. And so I think that we have uh, a document that, that Democrats can look at and we could have a conversation of how to make the spending pieces better. Um, there is no question there was extreme disappointment from our side of the aisle uh, when we saw the governor's tax proposals decimated in the Finance Committee. Because those proposals, you know, we championed a year ago, we wanted a 1% decrease in the income tax. Um, because we recognize it is time to give back to the residents of Connecticut. So we are putting forth this tax package, mirroring it very closely to the governors, um, and also acknowledging things that are important to Democrats, um, like restoring a clothing uh, tax exemption for children and putting forth a permanent child tax deduction for families. So I think it, it recognizes what they have championed, and we are trying to bring both the Democrats and the governor to the table with this tax package. When you talk about um, successful elements of higher ed subsidizing less successful, are you referring to community colleges that were uh, enrollment is down? What, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I mean, when we, we look at it globally, we know our community colleges as a whole are running deficits, in, I think, over the next two years of $100 million. We've got to take a look at that. But when we look at the higher ed board of region system, you know, you have a school like Central um, that was able to adjust uh, their challenges of higher cost, and they are running in the black this year. Um, that surplus potentially can be eviscerated by the board of regions and put into other schools that are running massive deficits. Um, and, and that's not good for our higher ed system. If we have a school that is succeeding, they need that money to reinvest in the children's education. And so we want to take a pause. We recognize you can't do it tomorrow. So we are funding them in the first year of this budget, but we are saying we need the governor's OPM involved in this discussion, and we need to fix this because we've had 10 years of trying to fix the higher ed system, and uh, we're still in the same boat. Just add one more on that. So are you talking about the necessity to perhaps close campuses, or are you simply talking about a change in financial governance to give more autonomy to individual? Uh, well, that could be part of the conversation, but I, because I think that is a concern now. I mean, these schools need a level of autonomy if they're going to be cannibalized, and that's something that we want to put on the table and recognize. But the other issue is, you know, have they right right sized themselves? You know, are the administrative costs in line? Are the teacher, uh, the student faculty ratios um, still balanced? All of that needs to be looked at because um, our, our education systems can't be running that level of deficits. And we can't just come up with 300 million. Um, maybe this year, any money that we put forth, there's a cliff on the horizon. So rather than delay the inevitable of a school abruptly closing, which can happen, we are saying we need to start planning better. And I don't believe that the state community college system and the Board of Regents has done a good job of, of right-sizing. They had a lot of federal money come in over the last three years, 
and they had opportunities to make fixes. Um, nobody is surprised by this except for them somehow. Based, based on talking to the governor, are, are you predicting here that uh, the revenue intercepts and things of that nature will, will definitely not be in the final package? I, I would hope so, um, especially given the fact that we saw $500 million disappear yesterday. And ironically, I think the revenue intercepts were $500 million. So it should be a wake-up call for Democrats that this is not the time for gimmicks ever. What happened when I was supposed to get my check, uh, <laughs> Oh, well, you're still on that. I, <laughs> yeah, it was a blink of an eye. I can't even recall these rebate checks. But, you know, I will say, and, and to not, you know, to be cute about it, but not, you know, a, a lot of constituents came forward, whether it was Hero Pay or the child tax credit that was given out, that they missed their window to apply. And they were frustrated, or they, they um, didn't get back what they were anticipating. We need to stop those gimmicks of rebate checks, and we need to structure a code um, that everyone can benefit from when they file their tax return. It's that simple. We are not looking for press releases, unlike the other side of the aisle. We are looking for substantive changes that people will benefit from. The has uh, held out, and I guess the Democrats agreed to it, it uh, the highway user tax as a means of uh, leveraging uh, federal aid, uh, especially uh, competitive grants that uh, we're going to be seeking. Um, one, do you, do you agree with that point of view? And two, how do you propose to leverage uh, those federal that, those federal funds without that tax? Well, first of all, we saw yesterday that OFA has already revised downward the amount they expect to get from the highway use tax, and I, I fully anticipate that we'll go further down. And I think this, this plays into the need to set up a transit authority. We are looking at creating a whole new transit system, transitioning away from fossil fuels. There's a whole lot on the table. If we are going to fund the transit system of the future, and by the way, the governor is bonding for much of that federal match for those highway infrastructure money, something we had suggested many moons ago but was ruled out, but never mind, we've moved on. Um, <laughs> we need to have a, a path to the future that takes into account all of our transit needs. Rail is at 60% of prior levels. You know, bus passengers may have come up, but in parts of the state where there's no bus service, we actually put in a micro transit for parts of the state for ADA and low income people where there is no bus service. So the highway use tax is a way to pave our way to paradise? No. A sensible look at where we want to go as a state in terms of transportation and the best way to fund it, that's the way to pave our way to paradise. Education, so not just higher education, but you had mentioned for uh, K-12, if you will. You seem to be very generous uh, in having the end of the budget tax. Is that because of the teacher shortage? And, uh, so there's, there's many components to that, right, if we start talking about the education funding. For me, first and foremost, as I said, is the state of Connecticut's constitutional obligation to provide a free and public education for every child in this state. The state of Connecticut abdicates that responsibility to the towns. And at that point, then you see an increase in property tax, um, which makes towns harder to live in. If you can't afford to live there, you can't go there. It's a, it's a vicious cycle, right? So I've said it before and I'll say it again, either it's a priority or it's not. It's a priority for us. Um, education, especially in the elementary and secondary areas, are a priority for us. It is the pathway out of poverty. It is the pathway to um, better jobs. It is the pathway to success as an adult. So we do fund it more because we just believe it's a priority, right? So it is definitely in focus of the ECS area. It's in focus of the excess cost. But one of the things that's also in there, and this is in both budgets, um, something that I'm very passionate about, which is holding all the other towns harmless with the ECS, right? If we look at the amount that we're actually paying per child, um, it is woefully under a lot of the other initiatives that we do in the state of Connecticut, right? So you don't have a good successful populace if you don't have a well-educated populace. So it's just a priority, and we're making sure that everybody knows that from the Republicans' perspective, education is one of our top priorities. Uh, $200 million savings in uh, people not being hired. What's the ballpark number then we're dealing with to get to uh, $200? Uh, what, what how many jobs would not be hired? None. 
It's, it's fully actualizing the entire hiring plan. So how many openings are there now? How many vacancies are there now in state employment? Well, like I said, I think it's between last, when I calculated off the sheets that they gave me, it's about 17% vacancy right now. It's over, uh, you're asking me a specific number here, so I'm gonna give you an estimate until I can look at it. It's about 3,500 employees that we have for openings right now. So our budget fully assumes we're going to hire all of those, right? But we're not hiring them all on July 1st, because <laughs> it's not possible. It's not even at Hogwarts, it's not possible. Um, it's nowhere. So we're, we're saying you're gonna hire those people, but you're gonna hire them, ooh, sorry, in a staggered manner, which is what we're seeing from how they're actually hiring people right now, which is why we asked that question. What were your opens last year? How many did you hire? What was your hiring ratio? So this just takes actual behavior that we're seeing right now and extends it into the budget. So no job cuts at all. Well, thank you, everyone.